All right, um, so it's my great pleasure today to welcome uh, Steve Kibbleson from, uh, Professor Steve Kibbleson from Stanford University. Um, Steve is a very, it probably needs no introduction to this group, um, but he's done an enormous amount of really uh, uh, well-known work uh, and really important work in a wide range of, of uh, condensed matter physics, everywhere from fractional quantum Hall to intertwined orders and high TC uh, uh, and uh, many other uh, important areas. Um, and uh, I've, as Steve's also a uh, really incredible mentor, I've learned an enormous amount uh, from him when I was doing my PhD at Stanford. Um, and so it's really great to have him here uh, to give our virtual CMTC seminar. So uh, Steve, uh, today we'll be talking about anomalous metals. So uh, thank you, Steve. Good. Um, well, strange giving this uh, without being able to see anybody and uh, uh, without being there, but uh, feel free to interrupt with questions. I, I would prefer not to have to look to see if people raise their hands. So are people enabled to just uh, uh, interrupt? Yeah, yeah everyone's okay, able good. to unmute themselves. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so uh, the topic of my uh, talk is anomalous metals, and I'll define what I mean by that. But uh, to begin with, uh, when I had uh, asked for advice on what I should cover, uh, Sankar Dasarma, your colleague, suggested that I start by discussing a little bit of a broader context of strange metallic behaviors. And so uh, that's what I'm going to do. Let's see, I guess I should mention the, all the work that I'm going to describe that, that's not other people's work is work I've done in collaboration with Boris Spivak. Uh, some of it also in collaboration with Aaron Kempel Tilnik, and some of the early work in collaboration with a student from some time ago, Paul Oretto. Hmm. Now that's interesting. Okay. So, um, so let me discuss some classes of metallic behaviors. Uh, this is an incomplete uh, list. Uh, if you ask me afterwards, I can expand upon it. Uh, I don't know if I have a complete list, but I have a more complete list. But to begin with, there are good metals or simple metals or Fermi liquid metals. There are incoherent metals. There are bad metals, which come by many names. They're sometimes called strange metals. And in fact, uh, these are a very popular topic and lots of fancy words are associated with them. They're quantum critical metals, that is to say metals near a phase transition where quantum critical fluctuations strongly affect the properties of those metals. And then there are the anomalous metals. Anomalous metals deal with behavior of metals at the lowest accessible temperatures. That's the statement of empiricism. Uh, conceptually, these are states that at least appear to be uh, persistent down to zero temperature. And so states where we might want to try to understand the properties of the metal truly in the zero temperature limit. And uh, there's, uh, uh, among these, there's metallic phase proximate to the superconductor to insulator to metal transition. There's metallic phases proximate to a metal insulator transition. And there are metallic phases in quantum hole systems uh, at even denominator fillings. Steve, I already have a question. It's just nomenclature. This is Shankar. Uh, do we actually know of any system where whatever anomalous property is defined, let's say linear in T resistivity, actually persists to zero temperature without a strong magnetic field, or even in a strong magnetic field, actually to let's say below one Kelvin? 
So I'm going to be talking primarily about systems where, as far as we know, the behavior I'm describing persists to zero temperature. And this is both with and without magnetic fields. And this is in uh, proximity to a superconductor to metal transition. Okay. All right. so that's going to be the main topic of this Good. discussion. Good. So this would not then apply rigorously to cuprex, would not necessarily apply rigorously to cuprex, for example. So I will show actually some data from a cuprate, but, um, but it's a special cuprate device. So uh, in fact, it will uh, pertain to the cuprates. Uh, it, it pertains to some of the cuprates. Let me, sure. let me be sure. tricky about that for now, and we can come back to that. I can give, uh, unfortunately, I can give a very lengthy answer to that. All right, we'll come back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so here's, I'm not going to cover all of these. What I'm going to do is I'm going to first start by telling you about good metals to contrast it with the other metals I'll describe. I'm then going to discuss my rather uh, idiosyncratic view of incoherent metals. Um, I'll talk about bad metals. I won't talk really at all about the theory of bad metals, just what is meant by bad metals, why I think that's the right name for them, and what the essential features are and what some of the challenges for theory are there. I'll skip quantum critical metals because that's a rather specialized topic and probably roughly understood. Um, and then I will get to anomalous metals, which is the main topic of my talk and one particular subset of those, namely the metallic phase proximate, ooh, that's supposed to be, that's misspelled, that's supposed to be an A, proximate to a superconductor to metal transition. Okay, so let me start with simple metals. And I can't, uh, I can't um, resist uh, being a little bit philosophical here. Uh, this is a topic that's not very popular now. It's not considered to be very deep or interesting theoretical physics. That's because the explanation, the theory of simple metals is as the name says, simple. It can be understood in terms of the properties of non-interacting quasi-particles with much the same properties as electrons. But don't let that fool you. This is by far the most exotic phase of matter that's ever been seen. It's uh, uh, the theory, the Landau theory, Fermi liquid theory of the metallic state certainly ranks among the greatest achievements of theoretical physics. The properties of such states are emergent in the truest sense of the word and are both remarkable, but also are actually measured. This is not mathematical fantasy, but all of these exotic properties of this phase are really things one measures in the laboratory. So um, there are a number of things about this phase that you should reflect upon. One is that it's extraordinarily robust. We see it in hosts of materials, despite the existence of a large density of gapless modes, in particular, the existence of a Fermi surface, which gives it an anomalously large low temperature specific heat that's simply linear in temperature. Uh, it does have one marginal instability, the BCS uh, instability to superconductivity. And in fact, this is the central pillar of the BCS theory of superconductivity, which is among the other great accomplishments of theoretical physics. It is a state in which there is dissipation, quantum dissipation in the system in the sense that the conductivity remains finite as the temperature goes to zero. So this system 
is able to dissipate uh, heat uh, even in the limit that the temperature goes to zero. It's the most entangled of any quantum phase of matter. This, I think, is actually totally uninteresting, but I include this to be stylish. And it has emergent quantum effects on all scales. So for instance, the magnetization is a scaling function. It's linear in the magnetic field and then times some function, which yes, depends on D in units of the Fermi energy, but also depends on this uh, scaling parameter B over T. And so has different behaviors depending upon whether B is greater than T or T is greater than B. Here's an example of the, well, this is the susceptibility, it's the derivative of the magnetization with respect to magnetic field of some metal at low temperature. This is characteristic of what's seen in clean metals. One can see hundreds, even thousands of oscillations of the magnetization as a function of magnetic field. The uh, frequencies and the amplitudes of these depend uh, on the orientation of the field uh, and uh, it's incredibly rich and incredibly unintuitive uh, uh, observation. Uh, Steve, can I ask you another question on the thing that you said, not particularly profound or interesting, which I agree, quantum entanglement. Uh, that statement, this, you know, which often is stated in a very profound, I'm really tremendously tickled by hearing that you are saying something I have said and taken some flag, that what is the big deal? Is he saying anything more than there is a Fermi surface, this long range entanglement statement? Yeah, I mean, I think it, so yes, it does say that there's a Fermi surface. I mean, really what it says is there's no length scale. Correct. So when you, when you define a region, yep. the borders of that region are not sharply defined. And that's what gives this additional logarithm. Yeah, the logarithm part is somewhat interesting and it's because yeah. of what you just, yeah. okay, good, good, okay. But um, so, so this makes contact with, uh, with a branch, but it's not a measurable quantity. So, uh, yep. so I think these other things are more exciting. You know, this, this is really data. Okay, and so let me, uh, let me uh, uh, celebrate this a little bit. Um, you know, I learned this also when I took elementary solid state physics and the description of this was so matter of fact and so boring that I never really appreciated what a remarkable thing this was. So, the magnetization goes like some amplitude factors that I'll discuss in a minute, but then it oscillates as a function of one over B. So this is an essential singularity as B goes to zero. The oscillations become infinitely rapid as B goes to infinity. The period of this oscillation is determined by the area of the Fermi surface in the plane perpendicular to the applied magnetic field, times the quantum of flux. That is to say, notionally, it's given by fundamental constants of nature times the area of the Fermi surface. And so these oscillations are actually a direct measure of the geometry of the Fermi surface that uh, Sankar just uh, mentioned. The amplitude consists of two factors. One is a thermal factor, which I've called I sub T, which is equal to the temperature times the Fourier transform of the derivative of the Fermi function. It's this function, T over sinh of T over TB. TB is just the cyclotron energy in units of uh, temperature. So it's something about the effective mass times B. And so this is amplitude is one when the temperature is small compared to the magnetic field. 
and exponentially decaying when the temperature is large compared to the magnetic field. Uh, I do want you to notice this rather remarkable temperature dependence here. This isn't a typo. This is not supposed to be an Arrhenius temperature dependence. This goes like e to the minus t. And that's a characteristic feature of uh, quantum interference between coherent quasiparticles. So this temperature dependence is a direct measure of the Fermi statistics of the elementary excitations in the system. And finally, there is a so-called Dingle factor. The Dingle factor is exponential in 1 over b again, where this Dingle magnetic field is equal to, again, the effective mass times 1 over the quasi-particle lifetime. This is actually, um, so you can think of B sub D as being the magnetic field at which the cyclotron frequency times the quasi-particle lifetime is equal to pi, or where the cyclotron radius is equal to pi times the elastic mean free path. So this factor directly measures the quasi-particle coherence time, tau. Uh, it's not a transport time. It's nothing collective. It's really directly a property of the quasi-particle. So, oh, hey, Steve, uh, sorry, this is Jay. Uh, hi, could I ask a hello? question? You, yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, okay, quick, quick question. Uh, so this, if, if we're really talking about an ideal system with no impurities, then this tau is somehow temperature and or magnetic field dependent, right? Correct. Um, so it, it's, um, you know, it will then, first place, it'll vanish. One over tau will vanish as the temperature goes to zero. Yeah. And typically at least as fast as the temperature squared. Um, so, uh, yes. uh, so this will be of negligible importance in that case. Uh -huh. Okay. So we that's, always that's have to... You know, in other words, in, before the, for the dingle fact, for the uh, thermal factor not to have killed us already, we have to be at temperatures low compared to TB. Right. But yes, you're right. It, uh -huh. it, you could get, you can get inelastic uh, contributions to this in principle. Uh, are there other questions? As far as I know, nobody has ever extracted an, an inelastic rate, rate from this. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Steve, that typically the Dingle temperature is associated always with momentum relaxation scattering. By no, no, no. No, it's, 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 it's impurity scattering, but right. it doesn't, it's not necessarily, so it, it, it can be, this, this scattering rate can be faster than the transport lifetime. If you have oh, it is faster. Long, long wavelength disorder, yeah. it will contribute to this right. Right. Uh, dingle factor, but not to transport. Correct, because this is the imaginary part of the single particle self-energy, you know, exactly. the vortex correction that, but what I meant was that typically it's associated with an impurity scattering. Absolutely. Electron, electron scattering. Yeah, so, but, so I think that in principle, there could be a contribution from inelastic scattering, but it's always tiny at the temperatures and fields you're interested in, it's always tiny. If, if you're seeing quantum oscillations, it's going to be tiny compared to the impurity scattering. But what about materials where people believe that even higher temporary resistivity and so on are dominated by electron electron scattering, let's say heavy fermion or something like that? Well, you end up going to very low temperature where the T squared piece is tiny still compared. I, I mean, so, so is it then correct what you are saying is that this tau, uh, nobody has seen a direct T square effect in this tau from uh, the Haas van Alphen effect ever? Not as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now, uh, now let me, so having uh, spent a little time grooving about conventional theory of metals, let me now get to the conductivity, which is the main measured quantity I'll be discussing 
in the remainder of this talk. And I'm going to start by doing something that's rarely done. I'm going to do dimensional analysis. Uh, so I'm going to ask, what is the quantum unit of conductance? And so if you wanted to produce a quantum of conductance, that is to say something, I'm not going to refer to the properties of any material, but just the fundamental constants of nature, I would construct it like this. Uh, well, this is the quantum of resistance, H over E squared times the Bohr radius to the D, that's the number of spatial dimensions, minus two power. And so for D equals two, this is familiar. This is the Klitzing constant. This is 25 kilo ohms. And that, of course, shows up all the time in uh, quantum Hall effect, for instance. But this same construction applies in any dimension. And in three dimensions, uh, people have not particularly stressed that there is a quantum of, of uh, resistance. So I'll call it the Kivelson constant. Um, <laughs> Uh, where we have a single power of the Bohr radius here, which this gives us 136.6 microohm centimeters. So my theory of the resistance of materials is that unless something interesting and emergent happens, the resistance should be on the order of the quantum of resistance, 136.6 microohm centimeters. And then you mean at zero temperature, right? No, I mean any time. At any temperature, you're saying. What? So, if, what if? There well, is of course, any temperature where quantum mechanics is important. Okay. So I'm not any going to be talking no about coffee. plasmas in the sun, but no. okay. but anything where the temperature is small compared to the Fermi energy. Good. I agree. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. In in you know two-dimensional dilute metal temp. Fermi temperature could be 100 millikelvin. Yeah, you yes. want to be lower than Fermi temperature. Fine. No, no, I want to be where quantum mechanics matters, but so otherwise I could use factors of the temperature here. Um, so in a quantum system. Excuse okay. me, uh, do you think the lattice would matter because you use the Bohr radius? Should you replace it with lattice constant on a lattice? So, you know, if I'm defining a quantum of something, you know, when I tell you that there is a quantum. I don't really tell you what I'm thinking about, what material, it could have whatever lattice constant it wants. Now, then, you know, whether this quantum of conductance teaches us anything or not, whether we should be replacing the Bohr magneton with some effective Bohr magneton in certain cases, maybe. But right now I'm doing something very much more primitive than that. This is a priori, knowing nothing about what material I'm looking at, or uh, whether it's got a complicated crystal structure or a big Fermi surface or a small Fermi surface, I'm going to define a quantum of conductance, which will allow me to distinguish whether things have big conductances or little conductances. Now, you may suspect that my quantum of conductance is meaningless because there are all these details that matter. So it's going to be incumbent on me to show you that this is interesting. But my definition makes no reference to what the lattice constant is, what the electron density is, what anything is. Okay. 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 So it's, a, it's, a, it's a different it's a different approach to this problem than you've probably seen before. Okay. As a question, uh, why do you uh, leave out the uh, one dimension? Ah, uh, just because the experiments I'm going to be talking about are in two and three dimensions. For so one dimension, there think, would be a factor of one over the Bohr radius here. Okay. Okay. One dimension is special in a number of ways. So uh, I'm not sure how, how useful this quantity is in one dimension. But, uh, but anyway, this, this, this quantum can be defined in any dimension. Okay. So I, I hope that clarifies what I'm doing. I'm doing something... This is, you know, this is the first time in my life I've ever done an ab initio calculation. <laughs> and so what I propose to do is to distinguish good insulators are going to be things that have a conductivity that's conductance that's much less than the quantum of conductance. And probably I'd also like them to have a resistance 
that's tending to diverge at zero temperature. So uh, as far as uh, scale, I would like it to say, diver be growing faster than the quantum of resistance divided by the temperature. Good metals then would have conductivities that are much bigger than this. And once this is true, uh, there is some emergent property, which are these wonderful quasi-particles we've just discussing, discussed. They're somehow weakly interacting. They're not, of course, the electrons are not weakly interacting. We know that's never the case, but the quasi-particles are weakly interacting. So their properties can be treated perturbatively. And there are all sorts of consequences of that, including Matheson's rule and, and of course, the fact that d rho dt is greater than zero in metals is something we understand on the basis of the idea that if there were no disorder and no, and no thermal excitations, the resistance would be zero at zero temperature due to Bloch's theorem. And therefore, anything that we do that disturbs that is going to cause the resistance to grow. So a lot of these familiar concepts, all of these make a lot of sense so long as we're in a regime where something remarkable is happening, maybe quasi-particles is happening. But it's going to be uh, questionable when the resistance gets to be on the order of quantum of resistance. So let me let me just take that. Let me forget that I know any solid state physics. Let me say, what would I expect if I had a metal with no emergent properties whatsoever? No quasi-particles, no long mean free path, no emergence, nothing other than dimensional analysis. So what I would expect is that in that case, that the conductance should be on the order of the quantum of conductance. Or let me, let me uh, uh, make that more explicit. My prediction is that anything that doesn't have a reason to have something else is going to have a resistance that's in the range between a half to two times 150 microohm centimeters. Right? That's my theory of incoherent metals. And it's not going to be strongly temperature dependent because the only energy scale in the problem is the Fermi energy. So I expect that it will be this value and it won't depend very strongly on temperature. So let's look at some things. So here, here what I've done, this is, I've just reminded you what the quantum of, con of, con of resistivity is, in, of resistance, resistivity is in three dimensions, it's 136 microohm centimeters. So I looked up various things. I found some metallic glass and a metallic glass, you wouldn't particularly expect emergent quasi-particles. And indeed the resistivity at four Kelvin is 280 microohm centimeters. Well, more or less within my factor of two of the quantum of resistance. And it's only very weakly temperature dependent. By the time I get up to 600, Kelvin, it's 250 microohm centimeters. That I consider a success. Here's uh, mercury, liquid mercury, which of course is not crystalline, at room temperature has a resistivity of 100 microohm centimeters. Here I found that this is for some reason at 573 Kelvin, but they've alloyed uh, potassium and mercury. So this is a liquid alloy. Here's the uh, resistivity of the pure mercury, which in going from 100 Kelvin to 573 Kelvin has gone up from 100 to 130 microohm centimeters. Here's its vari variation as a function of potassium until over here where I have pure potassium, it's maybe somewhat outside of my range. Um, but uh, this blue line is, of course, my, the quantum of uh, resistance. Here I found uh, some binary alloy, uh, titanium aluminum. Uh, when it's pure titanium, then at least at low temperature, the resistivity is much less 
than the quantum of resistance, uh, but it rises to values at 1,000 Kelvin that are right of this order. Once we alloy it with aluminum, it becomes more or less temperature independent and roughly equal to the quantum of resistance. This is the famous case of resistivity saturation. This is two of the A15s, old-fashioned high-temperature superconductors, uh, niobium-3 uh, antimony and niobium-3 tin. At low temperatures, the resistivity is much less than the quantum of resistance. One needs a theory to describe this. Uh, and indeed, um, Boltzmann transport theory and perturbative treatment of the electron phonon coupling produces a curve that looks like this, at which lies right on the data up to some point where it starts approaching values on the order of the quantum of resistance. Uh, notice it's T linear is not anything particular. This, the theory at least, gives a very nice T linear. It's the question of the magnitude of the resistivity that I'd like you to focus on. But then at high temperatures, the resistivity appears to saturate at a value on the order of the quantum of resistance. So people have said rightly that there's no theory of resistivity saturation. Uh, my claim is we don't need a theory of resistivity saturation. Resistivity saturation is what you would expect if there was no theory. This is the behavior of incoherent metals generically. It would be nice to have a theory of the first deviations from Boltzmann transport theory to something else. This could occur when the resistivity is still far from the quantum of resistance. And so it would be nice to have a compelling theory of this first turnaround. And there are various theories that have been proposed of that. I'm not sure that any of them's right, but I'm not sure that any of them's wrong. But this behavior is behavior that I claim we understand that's just the natural value of the resistivity. Okay, so I've now told you about good metals. I've told you about incoherent metals. What about bad metals? So, well, this idea comes to light now when we discover that there are materials starting with the cuprates, but now there's hosts of other stuff materials. This is a slide I got from Dmitry Bazov 20 years ago now, when it was still somewhat surprising. Here is the data on niobium-3 tin from the previous slide. Here's the saturation value of the resistivity. And here's optimally doped lanthanum cuprate, which has this famous T linear resistivity, but the thing that I think is more important than this is that this resistivity continues to increase with temperature. It increases up to a value. So let me put my version. This is the quantum of resistance. This is where resistivity saturation occurs in the albium 310. And what you see is that lanthanum strontium copper oxide simply doesn't seem to know about this. It punches through this and goes to very high values, values that you would have said should be characteristic of an insulator, were it not for the fact that the resistivity is a increasing function of temperature. Um, so here at optimal doping and 1,000 Kelvin, we have a resistivity that's something like 1,000 microohm centimeters, something like an order of magnitude above the quantum of resistance. Here's uh, lanthanum strontium copper oxide, same material as a function of doping. Here's our friend, the quantum of resistance. What you can see is that unlike in the previous curves where the quantum of resistance really meant something, it's where resistivity saturated or where the resistivity loitered when there was nothing for it to do, these materials really don't seem to care about it at all. Here at 2% doping, that's this sample here, 
we still have a regime where the resistivity is a very strongly increasing function of temperature, and yet, and yet it's got values that are improbably large, values that you can't possibly interpret in terms of quasi-particle scattering. It is actually also true that here the resistivity is more or less linear in temperature. Here I've drawn straight lines through the origin, and here is at 2%, here's at 3%, here's at 10%. In all the cases, these lines really do go pretty much through the data. Uh, that's interesting. That's certainly something one wants to understand. But from my perspective, what's the zeroth order thing to be understood here is why is the resistivity so big and yet an increasing function of temperature. And here, the resistivity gets up to be 11,000 microohm centimeters, that is to say two orders of magnitude bigger than the quantum of resistance. Here's YBCO, often considered to be the gold standard of the cuprates. This is optimally doped YBCO. YBCO, unlike most of the others, is not is only about an order of magnitude anisotropic between the in-plane direction and the out-of-plane direction. You can see here that the resistivity is more or less linearly increasing with temperature both in-plane, rho AB, and perpendicular to the planes, rho C. The two scales are somewhat different. The resistivity in the C-axis direction at room temperature is something like 5,000 microohm centimeters again, one and a half orders of magnitude bigger than the quantum of resistance. So what are the defining features of a bad metal? So there's a resistivity that is a strongly increasing function of temperature, often linear, which achieves a magnitude at high temperatures that's much bigger than the quantum of resistance. There's a second thing that I should mention. There are a lot of theories, there are even some very nice theories that produce T linear resistivities of large magnitude, but they fall afoul of a second thing that's been observed, which is that the optical spectral weight, that is to say the integral of sigma of omega up to some cutoff frequency that's large compared to the temperature, but not infinite, say, on the order of the Fermi energy, that the optical sum rule is roughly satisfied. That is to say that this integral doesn't change with temperature. And to have a theory that both gives you a increasing resistivity with temperature to values that are much bigger than the quantum of resistance and a conserved optical sum rule has proven to be quite difficult. I'll make a couple of other comments about bad metals before leaving the topic. So first, it seems to be a very general high temperature feature of materials that for other reasons we've classified as highly correlated electron fluids. This is actually bad news for a lot of the proposed explanations of this. It really doesn't seem to be all that special to the cuprates, so it's hard to see that it has anything directly to do with the mechanism of high temperature superconductivity in that it's seen in, well, materials that aren't superconducting at all and materials that are low temperature superconductors and materials that are low temperature Fermi liquids it seems to be some sort of rather generic feature of strongly interacting electrons. It also very frequently arises in complex crystals, that is to say crystals that have many atoms per unit cell and hence have very many phonon modes per unit cell. And also in all of these strongly correlated electron systems, there are strong electron phonon coupling. Uh, I strongly suspect that this is part of the story. And it's seen in good crystals, that is to say, in crystals that are as good as can be made. And more to the point, it doesn't seem to depend all that sensitively on the level of disorder of the crystals. 
which means that it's unlikely to have its origin in disorder. All right, that's what I have to say about bad metals. Uh, are there any questions before I get on to actually giving my talk? I have a question. Hi, Steve. Um, Hi, Mason. What about, so you didn't really define incoherent metal. Is incoherent metal and bad metal are basically the same aside from the resistivity or? Like no, so, so, I mean, a bad metal might well be an incoherent metal, but mm -hmm. what, what, it's got something else. So my assertion is, is that if we had an in, so if I have a metal in which the quasi particles have lost their coherence, then I would expect the resistivity to be roughly temperature independent and roughly the quantum of resistance because there's nothing special going on here. Mm -hmm. So bad metals, bad metals manage to get their resistivity to be much higher than that. So on the one hand, there's something, I don't know if it's coherent, but there's something that's strongly temperature dependent because their resistivity is, continues to be very strongly temperature dependent. On the other hand, their resistivity is, uh, is much bigger than the quantum of resistance. So there can't possibly be coherent quasi-particles where they're coherent quasi-particles, they would carry the current and their resistance would be much less. So I agree with you that they're a type of incoherent metal, but they have a, something else that makes them even worse than an incoherent metal. Maybe we shouldn't be thinking of them as a bad metal. Maybe we should be thinking of them as a bad insulator. Mm -hmm. So Steve, could I prolong this question a little bit? This is Shankar, because I want to go back to your uh, uh, description. There was really not a definition, description of the incoherent metal. I, I understand that bad is something in addition to incoherent. Mm -hmm. Just being incoherent is not enough to get a bad metal. And that part I, I think is very clear. But what you mean by incoherent is not clear to me. And this has been a problem in my various email communications with, with you. So my definition of incoherent, you know, I'm a pure Fermi liquid theorist, okay? So my definition of incoherent was when inelastic scattering is much, much stronger than the energy or the temperature itself. So you cannot really define a spectral function the spectral function is completely non-Lorentzian. The width is very large, and so on and so forth. It's okay, a so, so I'm I'm using I'm using a stronger definition. Of yes. So can you define it a bit uh, precisely? What you mean? That's all I'm asking. Yeah. What is right. your okay. right? So 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 good. So in order to lose quasi particles, you need that one over tau should be bigger than the temperature. So in that or, or sense, energy, or energy at low temperature, if you're doing a finite right. energy experiment. Right. right, exactly. So in that sense, uh, copper at room temperature is an incoherent metal. The resistivity is linear in temperature. The quasi-particle scattering length is linear in temperature. So at least it's marginally coherent. The width of the quasi-particle is equal to its energy. Um, however, Boltzmann transport theory works beautifully. Yep. Um, for an incoherent metal, what I mean is that the mean free path must be comparable to its Fermi wavelength or the scattering rate must be on the order of the Fermi energy. Okay, so that's what my incoherent metal is. There's no emergent scale here. Right. So I have, a, I have a huge problem with that. And let me explain what the problem is. Again, the problem is from microscopic theories, which you are not using very, very cleverly. Because I think of transport as connected with momentum relaxation, and I think of coherence as connected with energy relaxation, and they're totally different things. And so when I say something is incoherent, I mean it's true imaginary part of the self-energy is large. For so, so Shankar, within Fermi liquid theory, the transport lifetime is always longer than the quasi-particle lifetime. Yes. So if I, if I infer a short, transport lifetime, I'm sure of a short quasi-particle lifetime. Is that true? If it's all momentum scattering, I go to the exact uh, eigenstate representation and there is no lifetime at all. It's just okay. that I do not know how to do the calculations. Well, but I don't have a, I don't have a coherently propagating quasi-particle then. K, K is not a good quantum number. I completely right. agree. Right. But so I that's, still have quasi-particles. They just cannot be described by K. 
they can't be described by K. Right. So, so that's, I mean, you know, probably in the liquid metals that I've looked at, that I've mentioned, it's probably true that the energy scattering rate is much, much longer, much slower. Right. That's right. mostly elastic scattering. Yes. So, so I'm really just talking about quasi-particles as being peaks in A of K of omega with a well-defined K and omega. Ah, okay. Those, so those are completely gone. Good. All right. So, so you really are talking about quasi-particles where K and omega are both well-defined. And I think of it most as just K doesn't matter, only omega one to define. I'm just trying to understand your definition. I'm not, you are okay. entitled to your definition. Yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me get on to some things that I have more specific things to say about. So I'm going to talk about anomalous metals. So these are unanticipated, that is to say unanticipated by theory, metallic phases that appear in experiment at the lowest achievable temperatures. Now, this relates to another question that Sankar asked, which is, what does that mean about zero temperature? So. Theoretically, I believe these are phases that are described by finite resistance at zero temperature. Experimentally, all we can do is measure at the lowest temperatures and then extrapolate to zero temperature. These are particularly unanticipated because most of, until recently, most of the experiments were done in two-dimensional systems for reasons of tunability. And there was a theoretical dogma and this has been enforced where needed by calling in the Inquisition that um, insists that no metals can exist in two dimensions because of localization. So um, in fact, much of, I'm going to talk about the superconductor to metal transition, but I should warn you that prior to our work on this, most of the data that was published in this, if you want to look it up, you need to look up superconductor to insulator transition because despite the fact that in many cases there's no insulator anywhere in the data, this is the only theoretically allowed uh, construct under which this data could be published. So uh, the most important contribution I've made to this subject is this reviews of modern physics article with Aaron and Boris where in most of the paper, what we did was we simply gathered up all the data we could find on superconductor to metal transitions and presented it and explained that it was seeing a superconductor to metal transition. And since then, data has been coming out of people's drawers. People have seen this for years in multiple, multiple systems. And the experimental facts, I think, are now indisputable. So I'm going to first establish some of the experimental facts. I've taken longer than I expected, so I may not get to the rest of the talk. So what do we expect? So here's a phase diagram. We start with a system which at zero temperature undergoes a superconductor, superconducting transition as a function of temperature. We vary some parameter that doesn't change the symmetries of the problem, so something that's not a magnetic field. We drive the superconducting transition down to zero, and we're going to be seeing that in many cases, the phase that we get after here is a metallic phase in the sense that if any reasonable person takes the measured resistivity and extrapolates it to zero temperature, they will find a non-zero value. But it's an anomalous metal in the sense that up here at high temperatures or big tuning parameter, you see a Druda metal where at low temperatures, the resistance is, well, in all of these temperatures, the resistance is more or less temperature independent. Then you see some crossover here at which the resistivity drops dramatically to a value that's both much less than the quantum of resistance and much less than the Druda resistivity, but which is still non-zero. So that's the anomalous metal regime. It's possible over here somewhere in some circumstance, there might be an insulating regime, although in many experiments that's never seen. We can also tune this, uh, this transition with a magnetic field in 
two dimensions, the moment we have a magnetic field, we have some concentration of vortices. So we expect that the superconducting state will only exist as a zero temperature phase. So there'll be some crossover line here. There'll only be a true superconducting phase at zero magnetic field. Then though at a critical magnetic field, so in the superconducting phase, the resistivity vanishes as the temperature tends to zero. In the anomalous metallic phase, the resistivity approaches a non-zero value that's small compared to the Druda conductivity. And again, maybe there's an insulating behavior phase over here somewhere. In three dimensions, the, the shape of the phase diagram that you might expect would look more like that for the non-field tuned transition in the sense that there would be a suppression of the superconducting transition temperature to zero and then a quantum superconductor to metal transition whose character we might want to study. Um, coming back to the problem where we tune the, the uh, superconducting transition temperature to zero without uh, a magnetic field, this anomalous metallic phase here, since it has a resistivity that's much less than the Druda resistivity, we know that there must be some parallel conduction mechanism that's short-circuiting the quasi-particles, and the obvious thing is that's due to superconducting fluctuations, but somehow or other the superconducting quantum fluctuations are so severe that the system, although it has very substantial superconducting correlations as codified by the small value of the resistivity, it fails to become a superconductor at low temperature. So uh, as I mentioned, all sorts of things on the superconductor to insulator transition really should be interpreted this way. Here's old data on the superconductor trans to insulator transition from Alan Goldman's group on films he characterized as granular. You can see that there is a superconducting transition when the films are thick. When the films are thinner, there's something that's a failed superconducting transition, but then it doesn't become an insulator. The resistivity saturates at low temperature. It can saturate with a value that's small compared to the Druda resistance, or actually even big compared to the Druda resistance, but it definitely is saturating. Similarly, here's data from Bob Dines on granular lead. I'm just uh, explaining why we need to re-report what's been seen. I'm now going to turn to the more modern data, the data that, um, that, um, that has come out in the last few years. So here is, I think, very beautiful data from my colleague. Uh, well, it comes from the lab, of course, of Sri Raghu. Um, with theoretical input from my colleague, Harold Huang. Um, uh, other way around, sorry, if the, those of you don't know. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, gate-tuned quantum superconductor to metal transition in a heterostructure of strontium titanite, strontium aluminate. So this is different values of the gate voltage on different, uh, and this is the resistivity versus temperature on a logarithmic scale. So you can see that when the gate voltage is blue, the system has a nice superconducting transition. But when the state gate voltage becomes greenish or yellow, the resistivity is more or less temperature independent. Uh, even though the resistivity gets very high here, we never see insulating behavior. So these are bad insulators. I don't quite understand what's going on here, but at any rate, there's no question that what's going on here is a superconductor to metal transition. Here, it's easier to see on a, when it's plotted as first as one over T, which expands the low temperature scale. So I blow that up here. So notice this is the log of the resistivity. This is orders of magnitude, this is four orders of magnitude of resistivity here. This is one over temperature. You can see that at when the gate voltage is blue, the system becomes superconducting. When it's turning sort of aqua, the system starts out as if it's going to be superconducting. There are a number of features here that they've discussed. 
but the main thing I want you to focus on is that at low temperature, the resistivity saturates. And I think you'll agree that any reasonable person looking at this data would say that if I extrapolate that to zero temperature, that will approach a constant. Steve, what about the superconducting part? It's very impressive data, but do they verify the superconductor by magnetic measurements? Because resistivity is always a bit tricky, as you, as you know. Although it's very interesting, it's falling by a factor of 100. It, well, here it's falling by a factor of 100, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But so, yes. So, so first place, remember this is two dimensional superconductivity. So, you don't get a Meissner effect, but they do measure diamagnetism and they do measure a gigantic positive magneto resistance. Okay. So, you kill all of this with a magnetic field. Do they see any Fraunhofer uh, diffraction type thing? Do you know if they did that? They That's don't, that. but in some other data I'll show you they, okay, right. they do. Here's, by the way, some interesting, um, it, there's a paper that just appeared by these people on uh, the archive uh, this last, last week. And here's in this anomalous metal regime, the magnetic field dependence has this strange B linear dependence. I mean, it does round off at very small magnetic fields. It's not non-analytic as far as I can tell. But in this whole anomalous metallic regime, you get a very striking uh, V-shape magneto resistance. Uh, and so the thing I wanted to, uh, to show from this uh, new paper is a phase diagram that they've inferred. So here, here we're going to have magnetic field along this axis. We're going to have gate voltage along this axis and temperature along this axis. So for now, since we've been looking at data at zero magnetic field, I'd like you to look along the zero magnetic field plane. That's this plane here. And this is zero, temper zero temperature is on this line. And what you see is there's a superconducting phase. And then there's this anomalous metallic phase. And then presumably far out here where they don't quite access, there is a, in this experiment, there is a Druda metallic phase. The thing that's new in this paper is they've expanded this. We'll be looking at data as a function of magnetic field in a bit, but you can see that this anomalous metallic phase actually is the same anomalous metallic phase at zero magnetic field and at finite magnetic field. That's what these B linear terms are showing us. Here is a very different sort of system. This is an artificial system of aluminum islands on indium arsenide heter uh, quantum wells. And so the aluminum islands become superconducting, but they, uh, their Josephson coupling between the islands is modulated by the gate that gates the density of the electrons in the uh, indium arsenide uh, 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 portion of the system. Here's, again, log of the resistivity now versus one over temperature from the beginning on a log plot. This is over nine decades. And again, what you can see is that there's a superconducting phase. Then there's an anomalous metallic phase where the resistivity saturates at four or three orders of magnitude below its normal state value. And then in this case, when the gate is turned up enough, there is an actually genuine insulating phase. So here we have a superconductor to anomalous metal to something or other, the insulator transition. I did tell you I would look at uh, a cuprate. One of the nice things about the cuprate, I mean, there's bad things about the cuprates. They're complicated. Oh my goodness, it's already nine. Um, can I take five more minutes? Take your time. There are, there, are a lot of questions. there are a lot of questions, so, you know, it's not a problem. You can take 10 more minutes, not a problem. Okay. So this has the disadvantage that we're dealing with the cuprates, which has 
special interesting physics of the cuprates, but from the point of view of just general superconductivity, it has the advantage that the superconductivity is extremely robust. So we're not doing low temperature physics and low current physics. This is robust physics. This is from this interesting paper that was published in Science last year. And what they did was they made a heterostructure and then using ion beams, they patterned it to form this array of holes, which means that here these little uh, purple triangles are a representation of where the cuprate high temperature superconductor survives. So they're coupled by weak links. So this is made a artificially patterned array of Josephson junctions just using uh, YBCO instead of aluminum. And they use some, you know, extreme technology. So this is a very large device with 10 to the eighth holes. And here's on a logarithmic plot, the resistivity is a function of temperature. So here you see the, oh, and so this is, then they continue ion bombarding it. So this is the same device, but increasing the amount of disorder or decrease damaging the Josephson coupling between the different uh, superconducting islands. So when there's relatively little damage, this thing has a superconducting transition at around, I don't know, 80 Kelvin. As these are damaged, the superconducting transition moves down. Eventually, the system enters a anomalous metallic regime where the resistance is still large compared, a uh, small compared to the normal state resistance, but defined definitely non-zero, and eventually it goes to an insulating regime. Here's the data plotted versus one over temperature. So you can see that really at low temperature, the resistance becomes temperature independent. Uh, so this is a clear anomalous metal. Uh, at low magnetic fields, in this anomalous metallic phase, you see um, uh, little parks like oscillations. These oscillations correspond to one flux quantum through hole for each hole in the device, but these are metallic systems. So these are measuring the effect of the superconducting fluctuations. On a larger scale, you see a linear in field uh, positive magneto resistance of the sort that uh, Harold Wong showed in his strontium titanate at lanthanum aluminate devices. There's just now a new uh, chapter to this story. It's not so easy to tune a superconductor to metal transition in three dimensions, but this work by Jinghua Chu just appeared in Nature Physics. This has to do with another family of high temperature superconductors, the iron-based high temperature superconductors. This is barium, iron, cobalt, arsenide. This is the cobalt concentration. There's a pneumatic transition, which is to say where the lattice becomes orthorhombic. Then below that, there's an antiferromagnetic transition. This is an antiferromagnetic and pneumatic phase. It still has the orthorhombic symmetry. And then there's this superconducting phase. Uh, Jinghua was interested in asking, do pneumatic fluctuations play an important role in the mechanism of superconductivity? So he had the idea that maybe we would apply uniaxial strain, explicitly break the symmetry of the pneumatic order, by that method suppress the pneumatic fluctuations, and then suppress TC. So that was his idea. So here's a generalized phase diagram, here's temperature, here's doping concentration, sorry, here's doping concentration, and in this direction is uniaxial strain. And we'll take a sample with this particular value of the doping, somewhat weakly superconducting a TC that's maybe a half of the optimal TC, and apply strain to it and see if one can cut through this phase diagram and suppress superconductivity to zero by tuning a continuously tunable parameter. And indeed, he found he could. Here's the resistivity as a function of temperature for different amounts of 
uniaxial strain. So he was very excited about what this tells us about the mechanism of superconductivity. But the thing that I'm excited, well, I'm excited about that too, but the current purpose of what's interesting is that these tails here are clearly not going to zero. The, resist the superconducting transition has been suppressed to zero, but we have a three-dimensional anomalous metallic phase. Here's on a logarithmic plot, so you can see more clearly the resistivity has this e to the t-like behavior that we've seen before, but it clearly extrapolates to a finite value at zero temperature. So this is a very big deal. This is an anomalous metal in three dimensions with very much the same behavior as what's been seen before in two dimensions. Magnetic field. This is actually where the subject started. I think the first person to have the courage to say that he saw metal was Aaron Kapitolnik in this paper from 1996 on amorphous molygermanium films. Here at zero magnetic field, field, the film was superconducting, but when you apply a magnetic field, the resistance drops by, in this case, one, two, almost three orders of magnitude, but then saturates to a value at low temperature. Here's data from Triscone on strontium titanate lanthanum aluminate films, which shows something similar. Here's data from Aaron Kapitolnik on tantalum nitride and indium oxide films. Again, you should be bored with seeing things that look just the same. Now, some of you may be aware that uh, after our review article, there was a controversy that was raised. There was a very beautiful paper by Dan Chahar. And what he said was maybe, maybe all of this anomalous metal stuff is an experimental artifact. So what he said, and so they did experiments on this material, niobium diselenide, for which actually there were data that looked quite a bit like some of the data that I've showed you of an anomalous metal. And for this system, they showed that that data was an artifact, that the device had not been adequately filtered, that external radiation came in, that the external radiation kept the system from being in equilibrium, and that the saturation of the resistivity was due to external noise in the system. So they said, yes, it's a very sensitive superconductor, but maybe what we're calling an anomalous metal is actually just a fragile superconductor if we measured things at equilibrium. So there's been a huge amount of data since then. There have been data, as I've showed you, on all sorts of different systems, data that don't rely on low temperatures, data where filtering has been done up the wazoo and where um, and where all of these things have been tested. I would, I think this was a very serious and important issue because there's a lot writing on this, but I would say that by now the problem has been resolved, that this anomalous metal behavior is in most cases that are reported and in all the cases that I've reported is a fact. There is a very beautiful recent paper by Aaron Kapitolnik and Alexander Polevsky that just recently appeared on the archive. Here they've put granular indium on an indium oxide substrate. So the Josephson coupling between the indium grains is mediated through the indium oxide. Here they show a magnetic field driven superconductor to anomalous metal transition, just like what we've seen. But then what they've done is they've done various things. So take a look at this data here. This is at 0.03 Tesla. They've measured it with a, um, with a highly filtered system that gives, oh, and this is versus one over temperature. So low temperature is over here. So here you see this 
saturation. They then remove the filter and they see almost the same thing. They then purposely radiated this sample with two gigahertz microwave radiation, and that's this tan signal. So the main thing you should notice is that not much changes. This anomalous behavior is stable to external noise. It's actually sort of amusing that in this case, the data works in the wrong direction. When we turn on microwave radiation, the, system, the resistance of the sample actually goes down. The superconducting fluctuations are stabilized by the microwave radiation, not destabilized. And that can be seen even more dramatically, although right near the floor of their measurement resolution, if you look at 0.0002 Tesla. So here's the data with no noise and with good filtering, and you can see this anomalous metal. And then when you turn on two gigahertz radiation or you remove the, uh, sorry, if you turn on two gigahertz radiation, what you see is that within their noise, they drive the system superconducting. So here, in fact, the microwave stabilizes the superconductivity rather than destabilizing it. Okay, so um, I guess uh, I've gone way over my time. So I've told you the facts. I won't tell you any theory. Ah, here. So, um, so what I want to say about theory is that although the cuprates are complicated, strongly correlated material. Most of the materials that I've showed you are not strongly correlated materials. So this is anomalous properties of systems that should be described by weakly interacting quasi-particles and BCS pairing. And therefore, this is even more serious than you might have thought. As my co collaborator Boris Spivak says, we need another chapter of ADG. Uh, it, for reasons that I haven't told you since I skipped the theory, it must include both the effects of repulsive interactions and the effects of disorder. And it also likely involves discarding the weak localization religion and maybe even some of the sacred tenets of Fermi liquid theory. Okay, so that's my end. All right, thank you very much, Steve, for an excellent talk. Um, there have been a lot of questions so far, but if there are any questions remaining, people yeah, can... Yeah, Danny, I have a couple of more questions, but if somebody else wants to ask something, since I have asked most of the questions, I'll wait. Can I ask I have a couple one of question? Questions. Uh, uh, so my question is about, uh, are there any numerical simulations on some, you know, model Hamiltonians that show such an anomalous metal state? Because uh, you know, there is experimental evidence, uh, but the question is if there is some kind of unbiased theoretical evidence for the existence of such a state. So, so I believe we've established a point of principle, the part of the talk I didn't get to, that we have a model where there are limits we can take where we're pretty confident of our solution in which we can show the existence of an anomalous metal. But in terms of simulation, the problem is that this requires fermions. I mean, as I said, this is a property of non-highly correlated electron materials. So to understand it, we should start with a problem of weakly interacting electrons and disorder. Now, we can solve problems of weakly interacting electrons plus disorder if the interactions are all attractive. Then we can do sign-free quantum Monte Carlo and we can study things. However, on theoretical grounds, we do not expect an anomalous metallic phase in that case. We expect either a superconducting phase or an insulating phase. If we include repulsive interactions, then we can't do sign-free quantum Monte Carlo. So there really aren't any, as you say, unbiased theoretical tools other than actually finding limiting models that can be solved. And I think we've done well, 
the best I know how to do on that so far. Thank you. So, Steve, could I ask a question? No. Hello? Well, okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. I appreciate that. All right, so uh, so so somehow in all the examples that you you talked about, uh, superconductivity uh, played a, a, a role uh, in some somewhere. Um, I mean, just uh, based on some very naive intuition. I mean, you also mentioned sort of uh, the uh, sort of questioning the the assumptions of weak localization as being the ultimate fate in two D. So if I just had like some kind of I don't know, uh, low density metal, uh, like say, I don't know, like graphene, for example, or something, and just had disorder potential on top of that, leading to an array of puddles all over the place. Um, and I measured temperature resistance down to the lowest temperatures one could, we would expect resistance to just saturate, right? So, um... So I think what you're asking is this. Right. So, um, so the localization length is exponential if I have a relatively, exponentially long if I have a relatively clean metal, or if you want the temperature scale below which you expect to see localization goes like, E Fermi times E to the minus two pi squared times KFL. Uh -huh. So if KFL is substantial, this is, you know, smaller than H bar over the life of the universe. And it could be true in principle, uh, but, um, but have no effect. Uh -huh. So I have a couple of comments about this. So first place in some of these systems, we see anomalous metallic phases. And I stress the places where the resistivity in the anomalous metal was much less than the Druda resistance. But as I tune, I get to places where the drop as I go into the superconducting, into the failed superconductor is much less, so that the resistivity, even at low temperature, is on the order of the Druda value. And that Druda value is, in some cases, not so far from the quantum of resistance. So since we go to very low temperatures compared to E Fermi, if we use this estimate, we would be in the localization regime and we see no effect of localization. So that's the first answer. Right. The second answer is that believing that this result means anything is to my mind, a piece of extraordinary theoretical arrogance. This is a perturbative effect if KFL is large, this means that you think you've solved the problem <clears throat> accurately to scales many, many orders of magnitude below the Fermi energy. Now, you know, we happen to know it is the right answer for non-interacting electrons, but we don't have non-interacting electrons here. We have weakly interacting quasi-particles. And to believe that this perturbative calculation that gives us a energy scale of 10 to the minus eighth times E Fermi, that no new physics from the interactions occurs between E Fermi and 10 to the minus eighth or 10 to the minus ninth times of E Fermi is, well, it's sort of uh, on a par with string theory. Okay, so uh, this brings up the question I was going to ask. It's uh, Steve partially answered it, but I still want to ask it. So keep that slide on because this is a key question, right? So first, your definition of anomalous metal, I was going to ask the definition, but I think you just answered that. It's a, it's a metal which doesn't go superconducting as you go to low and low temperature, and you are positing it remains a metal even at zero temperature. Correct. Weak localization doesn't apply. That's that's the definition of your anomalous metal, correct? Even in two dimension, right? Correct. Okay. Or in so, three dimensions. Yeah. So quickly, why? What is special about three dimension? Three dimension regular theory allows you to have a metal at t is equal to zero. Why is it anomalous? I didn't understand that at all. Yeah. So I I didn't get to the theory part, but there's another piece of um, of 
conventional theory, oh, I didn't include it, which is the Ginsburg criterion. Okay. Okay. So by the Ginsburg criterion, you would have expected that as TC goes to zero, the superconducting fluctuation regime becomes asymptotically vanished. Mm -hmm. So indeed, a superconductor to metal transition in three dimensions is not surprising, right. but critical phenomena, that is to say quantum fluctuations of the superconducting order parameter past the transition, that is anomalous. There is no conventional theory of that. It's, it's more like an anomalous superconductor than anomalous metal, but I understand the point you're making. Let me now go back to the basic question, which uh, is, is first, empirically, is localization not seen or not? And I think you touched upon that, but as you know very well, one has to be extremely careful, right? Because there are these other silicon MOSFET experiments in which you worked, I worked, Kravchenko et al., where for a long, long time, uh, the claim was weak localization is not seen. But now, and I always maintain if you go to low enough temperature, you should see it. And now most people, not Sergei Kravchenko, but everybody else, including Miriam Sarachik agrees there is weak localization at low temperature. Now, I don't want to discuss those experiments. That's like an old story. Yeah, here, I don't agree with that, but. Uh... Yeah, here, people like Kapitulnik, people I trust, let's say, are absolutely sure they see no sign of any weak localization to the extent they can do measurements and conclude. Because you showed results only on exponential log scale where you cannot see anything. Uh, you know, this absolutely flat region that you are showing is really flat, meaning if I now do a, you know, standard weak localization fitting, it doesn't work at all. Correct, I mean, for one thing, it's got the wrong temperature dependent. So it's, yeah, I to the that. extent that it's temperature dependent. It's more metallic than insulating, right? Yes, it's becoming, the temperature is always it's always decreasing with decreasing temperature. So the answer is that to the extent experimentally one can establish they remain metallic, no sign of weak localization. Yeah. Now comes the theoretical question. Wait, 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 let me go. Let me just show you the, I mean, Please. It's, it's, it's far worse than that. Okay, let's see, let, um, I must have missed it, okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, yeah, here, mm -hmm. look at this. So here, this is the quantum of resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. This is an order of magnitude bigger than the quantum of resistance. Yeah. yeah. I mean, forget system. about weak localization. Weak localization is... It should be strong localization, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see what you're saying. That there is no sign of an insulator, not even a regular strong insulator because you are at resistivity, resistance much, much higher. Yeah, this is, I would say, uh, remarkable, very dramatic. I, I see what you're saying. Now, going back to the theoretical question, experimentally, I think things are pretty clear. And I think that uh, you made a very good case that this metal, if anything, is not like any metal we know in two dimension. But theoretically, uh, again, one can question, but you can do an RG, particularly if the interaction is weak. And based on it, and this RG is not trivial. You know, it's not, not a one parameter RG, but this was the program started by Finkelstein, who, who tends to be, you know, you don't get much talking to him, but this is something I have done also. And if you do RG on the weak location scaling picture, throwing in interaction, at least in weak coupling RG, the picture doesn't change. Meaning the, you know, the, the, the details may change, but the fixed point survives. Uh, meaning, meaning- No, there are no fixed points. You flow- There's no fixed point, right. You conclude there is no, we are in 2D. You conclude that the insulating phase survives. I mean, there is no reason to question it doesn't no. survive. What you, you go to what some you, you sorry, know. What, what, you, what you conclude yes. is the weak interacting, weak disorder fixed point is unstable. You flow towards stronger disorder and stronger interactions. Correct. That's but the only thing that's under control. Right, but that's correct. You flow to strong coupling, and if you are a purist, you'd say you cannot conclude anything. I, I would not... That's that's, I what I mean. that's the problem with all RG, as you know. That the interesting cases, you can't conclude anything. <laughs> uh, well, but you, you can if you combine it with some strong coupling analysis that you understand. But here we don't have that. Okay, so what you are saying is that... But l let me, t I'll, I'll show you what I think is a, a very cool piece of RG analysis. It's very trivial, but it's... so. So there are two questions we ask about the anomalous metal. 
One is, why didn't it become an insulator? But more importantly, especially when the resistivity is low, is why didn't it become a superconductor? So let me discuss that. And the reason you might think it would become a superconductor is because the superconducting susceptibility of a non-interacting Fermi system has a logarithmic divergence. And because of Anderson's theorem, this logarithmic divergence survives even in the presence of disorder. The only thing that would cut this off is when the temperature got below this temperature scale I defined at which localization starts to be important, which when the resistivity is tiny, we can neglect. So this says that the uh, metal is always unstable to superconductivity. Okay, in fact, it's very similar. It's the mirror image of the statement that the Fermi liquid is unstable to disorder. It's a similar set of diagrams. It's a similar logarithm. So, now, okay, go on. Yeah. Now, what happens if I include weak interactions? Well, we know that weak repulsive interactions are marginally irrelevant. And what we normally say is if they're marginally irrelevant, that means we can ignore them. And so this is the right result. But marginally irrelevant interactions could be important. And this point uh, was made in a very complicated way in my paper with Boris and Paul Aretto, but just from an RG point of view was discussed in this beautiful paper by Shivaji, uh, Shankar, and Sid. And so the RG, the perturbative RG, is actually no different from summing ladder diagrams. It gives you an RPA-like expression for the susceptibility. And now if V is negative, whoop, if V is negative, this of course has a pole, which is the BCS transition temperature. But if V is positive, this has no pole, but this repulsive V changes us from having a susceptibility that diverges at zero temperature to one that approaches a large but finite value as the temperature goes to zero. So in the presence of repulsive interactions, we've qualitatively changed the, the answer to the problem. No longer are we perturbatively unstable to superconductivity. We have some range in which we're stable to superconductivity. So let me give you a slight counter argument, although I have not thought through this argument very carefully, that all indications of doing, adding interaction uh, Hunter, can I Can I interrupt you one second? Uh, I assume that people feel free to leave since it's a, it's a Zoom seminar, but I think we should make clear that, you know, we've gone long past any seminar and people should leave and whoever's yeah. interested should stay and talk. Right. We are discussing things now and, it, you know, nominally our seminars do not have a time okay. limit. I'm not sure I understand. So coming back of this RG, my understanding always was that if you actually take the Finkelstein scheme and do it right, the strong coupling that we cannot say much about where the thing is flowing is something the triplet channel, is some kind of ferromagnetic instability. Yeah, and this is, I'm not talking about, this is, this V is a interaction in the singlet Cooper channel. And it's irrelevant. Correct. But what about, what about the actual strong coupling fixed point in the presence of repulsive interaction? If that's a ferromagnetic instability, how are you going to have a superconductor? I mean, th this is my confusion. I mean, no, uh, it, if it becomes a ferromagnet, that will be another way. And I think that may well be an important piece of the, of the, of the anomalous metal. Uh, oh, that's what I we're see. working on right now, is I that see. ferromagnetic oh, fluctuations okay. could well. But this is the simplest thing to treat, because this is irrelevant. So in order to treat the triplet uh, attraction, you have, to, uh, you have to go beyond control. But this is an irrelevant interaction. So the perturbative result should be asymptotically correct. Yeah, this was my argument how scaling localization survives. But I see what you're saying. OK, OK, OK. But I got something from you, which is, I think, quite interesting, that you are actually arguing that even if the system goes ferromagnet, that may help superconductivity. It's not necessarily that destroys it. 
no, no, no. If it goes ferromagnetic, that's going to also, that's going to kill. So if it goes ferromagnetic for sure, that will mean that it in the singlet channels that we're looking at, that the superconducting susceptibility is finite. But even sufficiently large ferromagnetic fluctuations can do that. Okay. So in order for the metal to be stable, it has to not be a superconductor. Yeah, so yeah. we have to beat superconductivity. In this case, I mean, if we want to see an anomalous metal, uh, if we want to see an anomalous metal, um, uh, our big enemy is the superconductor. In fact, localization isn't really much of an enemy because, uh, as I said, um, you know, so imagine doing the following thing. Imagine taking a set of grains. Uh, yeah, imagine taking a set of grains and embedding them in a metal. And then uh, superconducting grains. So if the metal has a divergent superconducting susceptibility, then at low enough temperature, this will become a superconductor. But if it's not, doesn't have a divergent superconduct, uh, 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 superconducting susceptibility, then if the grains are dilute enough, it won't become a superconductor. Now, on the other hand, that's what I wanted to say, on the other hand, there's another length scale that comes into this problem, which is the length scale over which electrons Andreev scatter off of grains. And that's, that's simply geometric. That's the uh, square of the distance between grains divided by the radius of the grains. So we can certainly arrange to have the grains be close enough to each other that this is much less than the localization length, in which case this length scale precludes localization. Okay, I don't know what happens at length scales beyond this, but the theory that you've used in order to derive localization is wrong past this length scale. And yet the system's not superconducting. So this brings up my last but reasonably important question. So the superconductivity here may not be phonon mediated at all. I mean, okay, experimentally, you do not know. Yes, but I what's do. your inkling that the superconductivity that was it seeing in these anomalous metal superconductor transition is probably- No, I think there's no doubt. There's no doubt that it's phonon. I mean, you know, it's aluminum on, on indium arsenide heterostructures. What do you think the mechanism of superconductivity in aluminum is? This comes it's, from the aluminum standard phonon mediated, so- right. And, and similarly, and similarly in Molly germanium, and yeah. similarly in well, okay, I don't know. Maybe lanthanum aluminate strontium titanate might have an unconventional mechanism. If I had to bet, I would bet on phonons, but I don't think it's been established. But then I'm missing something. Then why would the system going ferromagnetic destroy it? I mean, you know, you do not have ace wave ferromagnetic superconductors, right? I mean. Because so if the system, if these systems were ferromagnetic, yes, it would be no problem, but they're not. Ah, uh, I see. Okay, okay. All right. These are weakly interacting systems. Yeah. Okay. And for the most part, conventional singlet superconductors. Yeah. So the fact that remain metallic is the mystery here, real mystery, that the transition is between a metal and a superconductor. Right. And that the metal is anomalous. It's got yeah. strong temperature and magnetic field dependencies that a yeah. druda metal don't, doesn't. Mm -hmm. Steve, I have a question. I'm not sure I completely understood something. Is this anomalous metal really different from uh, just having some diffusive metal? So you mean, is there a phase transition between them? Yeah, yeah. Probably not. Okay, but, so, sh okay, go ahead. Yeah, but it's very, very different from a Drew to metal. That is to say, the resistance is very strongly magnetic field dependent in a regime where a Drew to metal would not be field dependent. It's got a value that's very low compared to the normal state value. So it's a metal in which superconducting quantum fluctuations have very long correlations and carry most of the current. 
and yet, no matter how much you lower the temperature, they don't condense. Uh -huh. Okay, so you know, as you as you start tuning away from the transition and the superconducting fluctuations become less and less, then this should be a diffusive metal. And then ultimately the question is why once it's there, doesn't it localize? And sometimes it does, as you saw in Charlie Marcus's data, when the resistivity get when we get far enough from the transition, we actually have another transition to an insulating state. That's a that should be a true quantum phase transition. But the, tra the it's a between the anomalous metal and a druda metal, it's a crossover, as far as I know. So is the mysteries are to kind of understand why it doesn't become a superconductor, what's the nature of the transition, what's how right. do you account for the temperature dependence of transport, things like that? Correct. How do you how do you get so first place, you know, uh, it's something that uh, you and most of the people in the audience are too young to think about, but why do you have quantum fluctuations at all in a metal? Most transitions in metals are extremely mean field-like. The theory of superconducting transitions based on BCS mean field theory is extremely successful because of the small Ginsburg parameter. And so here we have an enormous region with an enormous quantum critical uh, uh, effect of quantum critical fluctuations. So why do we have fluctuations? Why are they quantum? Why do they, how do they contribute? And why, do, why don't they condense at low temperature, low enough temperature? Those are the, the questions. All right, if there are no further questions, I'm going to stop the recording.